Coming up, I'll argue the most important thing about the Hunter Biden case is not the gun violation, but the vindication of the authenticity of Hunter Biden's laptop and everything on it. Former uh, UFC light heavyweight champion Tito Ortiz joins me. We're going to talk about why Trump is so popular among mixed martial arts audiences, but also among working class Americans in general. Hey, if you're watching on Rumble or listening on Apple, Google or Spotify, please subscribe to my channel. This is the Dinesh D'Souza podcast. America needs this voice. The times are crazy in a time of confusion, division and lies. We need a brave voice of reason, understanding and truth. This is the Dinesh D'Souza podcast. A good deal of the discussion in the Hunter Biden case has focused on the gun charge. Hunter Biden is an addict. He's not supposed to have a gun. He's asked on a federal form if he has a gun. He lies and says no. In fact, he does. This was definitively proved in the Hunter Biden case. And now he has been found guilty of three felonies. Now, there are people on the left basically saying, this is unfortunate. Uh, These charges should never have been brought. Other people have done this and they haven't been charged. But the predominant apologia for Hunter Biden has been really an apologia for Joe Biden, which is to say, hey, Look at Joe Biden's uh, love and concern for his son. He's a heartbroken father. He's already lost one son, and now his other son is in trouble. Hunter Biden was making his way out of addiction, but now this. So it's almost like an attempt to convert this disgusting individual, Hunter Biden, who's lived just a sordid lifestyle. Now, not more sordid than his dad. I would say his dad has basically established a tradition. Hunter Biden is in the tradition. So it's a very disgusting family all around. And I spoke a little bit about the details of that yesterday, so I won't revisit them today. But the point is that they're trying to make it look like um, this is a case where Joe Biden is uh, overflowing with affection for Hunter, and we should feel bad for Joe Biden. Now, first of all, Joe Biden's family is his own creation, just as Trump's family is his creation. And Trump has justifiable reasons to be proud of his family on the whole. And Joe Biden has appropriate reasons to feel disgusted, not just with Hunter Biden, but with his own parenting. Uh, with the way that Hunter Biden was raised to become the degenerate that he obviously is. But even though a lot of focus has been on the gun charge, on Joe Biden, and of course there have been the never Trumpers have taken a very consistent line here, and their line is, look at Joe Biden. He is not calling the trial rigged. He's not saying the judicial system is twisted or bent. Uh, He accepts the verdict. Uh, This is a model for how we should act in America. Our juries are trustworthy. It's a jury of the peers. Now, the Never Trumpers know very well that um, in the case of Hunter Biden, first of all, it was a it was a big question whether this guy was going to get convicted. Neither Debbie nor I thought it was likely that he would. Why? The trial was in Delaware. The jurors appeared to be very much sort of Bidenites taken straight out of Joe Biden's support base. And it looked like Hunter Biden would have an excellent chance to get a hung jury, maybe even an acquittal. But I think because this was such a cut and dried case, Uh, The jurors just read the instructions and they sort sort of saw no way to exonerate Hunter Biden short of like just nullifying and just saying, yeah, he did it. But you know what? We're just going to say he didn't. That can sometimes happen, jury nullification. But that's extremely rare. By and large, juries like to have some kind of, if only to convince themselves, some kind of rationale that they are what they are doing is consistent with the law, even though they might have made up their mind before. I don't like this guy. I'm going to I'm going to find him guilty, but I need to have a reason for why I'm going to find him guilty. Well, see, really, he, he had the motive. He went and bought the gun. It had to be him. 
uh, and so you, you squelch the idea of reasonable doubt, but you convince yourself that you've come up with a fair verdict. I don't think it's easy for human beings to say, well, you know what? I convicted an innocent, innocent man. I'm going to go home and feel like, wow, I did something great. I convicted an innocent guy. No, people don't like to think of themselves that way. And so the point is that with Hunter Biden, he couldn't get away with it. But the, the idea that this is somehow a, a fair system, no. If it were a fair system, Joe Biden would be under indictment. Jim Biden would be under indictment. Frank Biden would be under indictment. They would all be facing racketeering charges, uh, RICO charges, corruption charges, taking money from foreign governments and using it for your personal benefit, selling out your office and selling access to power. All of this, I mean, uh, an absolute procession of felonies. The fact that all of that has somehow gone away uh, they're not being charged, not just Joe Biden, the president, but other family members. It shows that the system is, in fact, rigged. Hunter Biden was getting, in a sense, a minor charge, a charge that, by the way, was in no way connected with Joe Biden. So a charge carefully selected by the DOJ not to have any kind of trail to the sitting president of the United States. So. The question now becomes, what's going to happen to Hunter Biden? The answer is, I don't know. Um, will he be given uh, prison time? Think about it. He's got three felonies. It would seem that some jail time at least would be warranted. And yet, from, the, from listening to the, the prosecutors, they look like having convicted Hunter Biden, almost as if to make a symbolic statement. See, we went after Hunter Biden, too. Uh, and we're going after Menendez in Jersey, so where's the, uh, where's the selective justice in this country? Having done that, they now want to give him the lightest possible penalty. And so I would not be surprised if there is an effort to, to get Hunter Biden just probation, house arrest, something benign that wouldn't even raise in Joe Biden's mind the need to pardon him. Because as I mentioned, pardon is a little risky for Joe Biden. Joe Biden is like, no one is above the law. Trump's not above the law. But since my son got convicted, I'm going to pardon him. That doesn't sound good. That doesn't actually fit with that rhetoric at all. That would be politically, I think, damaging. So Joe Biden might do it, but he'd do it only if he had to. So the question is, how do you make it so that he doesn't have to? I think for these reasons, I'm wondering if the judge, let's remember a judge in a hospitable jurisdiction, the very opposite of Trump. With Trump, you're dealing with judges in hostile jurisdictions, judges that have given money to Biden, judges that are lifelong Democrats. But here you've got a judge who thinks like Biden and is probably going to think of a way to try to give him a, a modest sentence. So while I have no idea what to expect, I think that there's a good chance that Biden won't need to pardon Hunter for the simple reason that Hunter won't be jailed as he should be in the first place. We recently had some monumental news and not in a good way that no one's talking about. For the first time in our history, the interest we pay on the national debt surpassed every individual budget item except Social Security. That's right. The U.S. now spends more on interest than on national defense or even Medicare. And it's only getting worse as big government continues to spend like drunken sailors. That's why savvy investors, central banks, and concerned savers are turning to gold, something not tied to the inflated U.S. dollar. You can, too, with the help of Birch Gold. For the more than 20 years, Birch Gold Group has helped thousands of Americans protect their savings by converting an IRA of 401k into an IRA in physical gold. To learn more, text Dinesh to 989898, claim your free information kit, no obligation, just information on gold. Birch Gold has earned my trust with their education-first approach. They're thousands of happy customers. They're countless five-star reviews, which is why I buy my gold from Birch Gold. You should, too. Protect your savings. Text Dinesh to 989898 today. Before I tell you about a very special offer, I want to first explain why this product is absolutely worth it without the discount. I don't take a particular supplement just because I get a discount. Anything as important as nutrition, I'll research it first. So if you go to balanceofnature.com, 
scroll down their homepage, you'll see all that goes into each bottle of this. These are fruits and veggies in a capsule. You'll see like I did, it's well worth it. But not just the ingredients, the real stories from real customers, and they have hundreds of thousands of customers. Each customer success story is just another example of how people are finding and taking Balance of Nature's fruits and veggies. So take their risk-free money-back challenge today. Use my special code, which is America. You'll get 35% off your first order. Plus this, it's free fiber and spice supplement, and you also get free shipping. So here's the number to call. 800-246-8751, the number again, 800-246-8751, or you can go to balanceofnature.com. When you use discount code AMERICA, you get the special offer, 35% off, plus free fiber and spice, plus free shipping. I am talking about the significance of the Hunter Biden conviction on three felonies, and um I want to make the point that, to me, the biggest significance of this uh, ruling is not connected with the gun issue at all. It's not even really connected with the um, issue of, uh, uh, of Joe Biden uh, and the pardon. It's not con connected really with the issue of jail time or no jail time for Hunter Biden. It's simply this. The one thing that became crystal clear in the um, trial was the validation of the authenticity of the Hunter Biden laptop. Now, the Hunter Biden laptop, as you know, has been a source of controversy for now more than three years, actually four years. It was the laptop that was whose existence was, the story was broken by the New York Post. Uh, it was a story that was censored across the board on digital media. It was uh, dismissed and ridiculed in mainstream media. You remember the 51 intelligence officers who, were, who signed a statement. Actually, it was not 51. It was really 60. There were nine unnamed figures uh, who were also on that list. So 59, I mean, 51 is the way people normally say it. So I'm going to say 51. Uh, but it was really 60. Nevertheless, these guys all said this has the hallmarks of Russian disinformation. That uh, qualified statement, the hallmarks, meaning the signature, the fingerprints, was then amplified into this is Russian disinformation. That's the message we got from CNN, from MSNBC. So this is a major reversal because now the Biden DOJ itself goes before the jury and goes, we've authenticated the laptop is real. It's authentic. It's Hunter Biden's laptop. The Russians were not involved. They did not plant material on the laptop. So all that stuff on the laptop, all of it, the hookers, the cocaine, all the disgusting behavior that's portrayed on the laptop and all the corruption all the secret meetings, all the money changing hands, all the records of transactions, it's all authentic. And uh, so you would expect at this point, or maybe these days we are trained now not to expect, but there needs to be some sort of a reckoning, doesn't there? Uh, and yet, not only is there no reckoning, but here I have an article in the New York Post, ex-Intel officials who smeared Post report on Hunter's laptop as Russian disinfo stand by signing letter. And a couple of these guys basically say, they just say, no, I'm not going to remove my name. Uh, and others offer completely bogus rationales. Here's Mar Mark Zaid, an attorney for several of the signatures, here's what he says. There continues to be by many a calculated or woefully ignorant interpretation of the October 2020 letter signed by 51 former intelligence officials. A careful and objective reading of the document shows that even today its content is accurate. What? Accurate how? Well, he basically goes on to say it's accurate because it doesn't say it was Russian disinformation. It merely said it has the hallmarks. This is very disingenuous because the point of saying that it, that it has all the hallmarks is to say that it is Russian disinformation. In other words, we experts looking at this laptop see in it the indications, uh, the DNA, the fingerprints, 
of a Russian operation. And that's what people believe. They're like, well, we're not the experts, but you are, so we'll have to take your word for it. The, um, and yet, here is another guy, Greg Treverton, um, chairman of the National Intelligence Council. What we said was true. We were inferring from our experience, and it did look like a Russian operation. We didn't and couldn't, of course, say it was a Russian operation. So the same kind of defense. We, we thought we saw some familiar signs of a Russian operation. Well, what were those signs? Just the fact that it was damaging to the Bidens? Just the fact that it contained all this detail on Hunter? Now, Hunter himself dropped off the laptop at this repairman shop, and the repairman was the guy who turned it in. So where did the Russians come into the picture? When you can actually trace the lineage, the genealogy of the laptop straight back to Hunter, where was there any evidence the Russians got involved with this at all? There was absolutely none. It's quite clear that this is a treasonous effort to interfere with the 2016 election. This is what, I'm sorry, with the 2020 election, this is what these intelligence officials were all about. And that's why many of them, when they were asked to sign, they didn't do any work on their own. They just got a call from one of their buddies, hey, will you sign? And it was like, this. they probably said, this will help like Joe Biden get across the finish line. Oh, okay, I'll sign. Yeah, I'm happy to give my name because we, the intelligence establishment, do not like Trump, we'll do anything we can to help Biden get elected. So I think that if Trump is elected, these guys need to be investigated, need to be indicted, need to be prosecuted, and prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. Now, this will be their defense. Their defense will be, well, based on our experience, we thought it was legitimate. So let them make that defense, but let them make that defense in court. The reason that these people are so arrogant is that none of them have had any accountability at all. Think about the big scandal that preceded this one, uh, and that is the Russia collusion scandal. Trump is a Russian asset. He's uh, in the pocket of Putin. The Trump campaign has been collaborating with Putin. All of it false. All of it made up. And yet, who has been called to account? Who has been forced to retract? Who has been charged? Who has been prosecuted? Answer, nobody. And so when you have this it's kind of like a bunch of guys. They they rob a bank. They do all kinds of um, stuff. Nobody nobody calls them. No one challenges them. No one arrests them. No one prosecutes them. And so what do they do? They keep doing the the spree of mayhem uh, and robberies for the simple reason that it is cost free. They're, they don't have to face any accountability whatsoever. So as long as that continues, these kinds of scandals will continue. And one of the rationales for bringing in a Trump presidency is to bring all of this nonsense to a stop. You might have heard Mike Lindell and MyPillow no longer have the support of their box stores or shopping channels the way they used to. They've been part of this cancel culture. And so they want to pass the savings directly on to you by having a $25 extravaganza. When Mike started MyPillow, it was just a one product company, just pillows. But with the help of his dedicated employees, they now have hundreds of products, some of which you may not even know about. So to get the word out, I want to invite my listeners and viewers to check out their $25 extravaganza Two-pack multi-use my pillows, twenty-five dollars. My pillow sandals, twenty-five dollars. Six-pack towel sets, twenty-five dollars. Brand new four-pack dish towels, you guessed it, twenty-five dollars. And for the first time ever, the premium my pillows with the all-new Giza fabric, just twenty-five dollars. By the way, orders over seventy-five dollars will get free shipping as well. This amazing offer won't last, so take advantage of it. Call eight hundred eight seven six. 0227, the number again, 800-876-0227, or go to MyPillow.com to get the discount, to get the free shipping. You got to use the promo code. It's D-I-N-E-S-H Dinesh. I'd like to invite you to check out my local channel. Good time to do it with the election approaching. And it's a good way to support my work. I post a lot of exclusive content on locals, including content that's censored on other social media platforms. 
On Locals, you get Dinesh Unchained, Dinesh Uncensored. You also see a personal side. I post some family photos and sometimes videos. On Locals, you can also interact with me directly. I do a live weekly Q&A every Tuesday, 8 p.m. Eastern. No topic is off limits. I've also uploaded some cool films to Locals. I've got Dinesh's movie page. 2000 Mules is up there, the latest film, Police State, and I'm working on a new one, a big film for this fall. By the way, if you're an annual subscriber, you can stream and watch this movie content for free. It's included with your subscription. So check out the channel. It's Dinesh.Locals.com. I'd love to have you along for this great ride. Again, it's Dinesh.Locals.com. Guys, I'm delighted to welcome to the podcast a new guest, Tito Ortiz. He is a former UFC light heavyweight world champion. He's also a UFC Hall of Famer. He's a businessman. He's an entrepreneur. And in addition to being an accomplished athlete and business guy, he's a successful movie and television actor. He's also a restaurant owner. Um, he has Tito's Cantina Tequila Bar and Grill. It's in, um, well, it's on Cape Corral Parkway in Cape Corral, Florida. You can follow him on X at Tito Ortiz. Uh, Tito, welcome. Thanks for joining me. Uh, I appreciate it. I got to say, as I was just saying a moment ago, uh, flashback to a few years ago, I've watched some of your uh, big fights and so was introduced to you that way. Uh, and then I saw more recently that you're offering some thoughts and commentary on Trump and the current situation in the world. And I thought it'd be great to have you on. So thanks for uh, thanks for doing this. Uh, let me start by asking you just a little bit about your life. How did you I mean, how did you make your way to to the UFC? Well, Dinesh, uh, in the beginning, I have to say thank you so much for having me on the show. I appreciate it. Uh, you know, I, I wrestled in high school. I wrestled in college, and uh, Ultimate Fighting Championship started in 1993, I believe. Uh, I watched it, and I had no idea if I was going to be a competitor in mixed martial arts or Ultimate Fighting Championship. Uh, I watched it. I'm like, these guys are vicious. They're animals. I mean, there's no weight classes, uh, no time limits. But as the sport evolved, it got better and better. Um, I, I started keeping my keen eye on it in uh, 1997, May 30th. Um, I fought for the first time and I fought for free. People kind of go, wow, Tito, why would you fight for free? Well, at the time, actually, I was in college and I was on a full ride scholarship uh, for wrestling. So I could compete in a professional sport that used wrestling. But I'm a very competitive person. I love to compete. So I thought, hey, let's give it a try and see if you like it. Um, see if I can do well in it. And I fought twice in one night that night on uh, May 30th. And I won one and that'd be 25 seconds and I lost one uh, in the finals to the guy who's ranked in the world. That was Guy Metzger. And I got, I got caught in a move while I was dominating and the referee separated us and put us back together. I was dominating and uh, I got caught in choke. But I, in my mind, I was like, wow, I like the sport. The sport's phenomenal. Um, if I train as hard as I did in wrestling, I think I can do the same thing here. Well, a year and a half later, I became the world champion of uh, Ultimate Fighting Championship. And uh, the sky was the limit after that. Um, went in five world titles, defending my world title five times after that. Uh, and having a career over 25 years, it made me understand business, um, uh, starting other businesses. I had a clothing company, I had a supplement company. I was doing uh, seminars. I was doing motivational speaking. You know, been to Iraq six times from the USO. Just so much stuff just led into, it was kind of was like a living there movie. It was, it was phenomenal. I really was happy with the progress that I was doing in mixed martial arts because a kid coming from the streets, you know, um, not really having a father, um, mother and father from seven to 14, um, were on uh, heroin and my mother got sober. I was 13, took me away from my father. I got into wrestling all the freshmen and then all the way up to becoming a world champion. And, you know, love in this country was something that I understood because growing up in the Reagan era, you know, I was just, as a kid watching on television, I always just heard them and it never really made sense until I got older and had kids myself and watching this country just really deteriorate to what it is today. It, it, it's sad and it happens so fast, but to you know, speak as loud as I possibly can because at the end of the day, I'm a blue collar guy. You know, um, yes, I make some great money through my fight career, but in the, the day, I, I have a restaurant, uh, as you talked about, Tia's Cantina here in Cape Coral, Florida. I, I really just uh, chasing this American dream because I know it's possible. Back in uh, 2005, when uh, Obama ran, or excuse me, 2006, when Obama ran, he said the American dream is no longer alive. And I say that's, a, that's false. That's completely false. 
you try to victimize people. And at the end of the day, I, I'm a person who wants to work hard. I love my country and I love my faith and I love my freedom. Um, this, this is really important to me and my family is my number one. If I don't have my family, I don't have anything. And I have three boys, my oldest son, Jacob, who's 22, goes to Arizona State University. Then I have my uh, twin boys, Jesse and Journey, who are 15 or are freshmen in uh, high school. And my beautiful wife, man, I, I we have a, a very strong family union. You know, we love God and we go to church. Um, we work hard and I work hard as hell to provide for my family. So through my career, I, I've really been able to be successful through hard work and dedication and uh, give uh, praise and thanks to, to the Lord and Jesus Christ to give me the opportunities that I've had of being an honest man, being a, a man with morals and values and it's important right now in this country. You know, it's amazing to me to see the way in which, I mean, when I was a kid, and I, w I grew up in Bombay, India, by the way. Uh, and when I was a kid, uh, boxing was the worldwide rage. I mean, I remember my grandfather telling me I was about eight years old about the Ali Frazier fight, for example. And so at that time, we didn't have a television, but I would wake, w you know, wake up early the next morning to get the newspaper, like the time, the moment it was delivered to sort of see what happened in the fight and so on. It seems like boxing has sort of uh, subsided a little bit and mixed martial arts has come to the forefront do you think that that's is there a reason for that is it because it's a more i mean boxing is essentially a kind of artificial fight right you have all these rules you can only use your arms you can't use your legs you can you can't punch below the belt if one guy goes down you got to go stand in the corner so it's a kind of a stage type of fight even though it's it's real Mixed martial arts appears to be more like two guys on a street corner. Uh, it's got rules, but it's, a, in that sense, a more free fight, if you know what I mean. Do you think that's, that explains the, the enormous uh, popularity and success of, of the UFC and of MMA? Yeah, I think so. I think people want to see how good a fighter really can be. And it was mixed, mixed martial arts. It's proving that now, you know, with jiu-jitsu, uh, wrestling, kickboxing, boxing, uh, Muay Thai kickboxing, having all these different martial arts and put them all together. You know, the Gracie Bama who first started back in 93, it was uh, something that kind of people seen as, um, gosh, like a circus act. But as these athletes got more and more trained and um, fans or the public got educated on what the sport really was, and this was after the Fertitta brothers and Dana White took it over um, to educate the public of what the sport was truly about. We did the Ultimate Fighter. Uh, people got to see how we trained. You know, we had characters, of course, like myself, the Huntington Beach bad boy. And to me, um, I, I watched professional wrestling. Um, as you spoke about Muhammad Ali, I watched Muhammad Ali so much. And just the charisma he had um, when he brought into the um, ring, I, I thought, how would I have a happy meeting between Muhammad Ali and Hulk Hogan? And I did that. You know, I had bleach blonde hair, flames on my shorts. I had the Huntington Beach bad boy, that bad boy mentality. But it was competitiveness for me. And to watch the sport grow to what it is today, it, I knew it was going to be to this point because when I would watch boxing, you know, I'm a huge fan of boxing back in Admiral Hearn days, you know, um, Oscar De La Hoya, Fernando Vargas, you know, all the way up to, uh, that yeah, was, uh, Asha, I think the name right top of my head, um, uh, Floyd Mayweather. I mean, these guys have been phenomenal boxing but at the same time. Mixed martial arts has been able to show the fans, uh, to show the fans of the sport of what fighting is truly about. And, like I said, we have time limits, we have rules, uh, there's weight classes, um, and as this uh, sport has been able to evolve, you've been attracted to so much. I mean, this goes back, I'd say, to the gladiator days. You know, in this, no one dies, of course. Uh, in UFC, they haven't had a death yet to date. In boxing, they have an average of three a year, and people don't hear about stuff like that because you're taking so much damage from punch to punch to head. There's always places that they can punch to the body and to the head. With mixed martial arts, you can do submissions, arm locks, chokes, uh, leg locks, um, a guy gets dropped from a punch, uh, the referee will stop if you can't tell you to defend yourself. And this type of stuff is able to have longevity for a fighter through years and years, as myself, five years. So just watching this sport evolve what it is today, I'm happy. I knew it was going to happen. Um, I knew it was going to happen this fast, as long as we educate the fans of what the sport was truly about. I thought it was interesting to hear Dana White talk about Trump and he talked about how from the very beginning Trump was very open to MMA, he was very open to having fights at his casinos. But I also noticed the phenomenon of Trump like walking these days into the UFC arena 
and it's like a deafening roar uh, rises up to greet him and it looks like he is like in his element now that in some ways seems odd right here trump is this billionaire uh you know he has golf courses and he lives in mar-a-lago um it would seem on the surface that this would not be a guy who would connect that well with like working class america and yet we see that not only does he connect very well with the working class white guy but increasingly hispanics latinos african americans blacks they're like wow we like this guy. We, he speaks our language. What do you think is the connection between Trump and not just the UFC or MMA, but in general with like the ordinary guy, the working guy in America? Well, you know, I really think it comes down to is Trump is one of the working guys. He's one of the guys who's worked really hard for their, his businesses and his name. Um, but at the end of the day, it's about this country now. Because back when he was on Oprah, he talked about it. You know, I don't think I would ever run for president. Uh, unless this country really needed it. We need him now. We need him now more than ever. And I think fighters, we've came from nothing. We've been able to achieve a lot in life. And Trump has done the same thing uh, with Latino voters, uh, African-American voters. Trump is not a politician. People don't understand this. He's a businessman in this company. Our uh, country needs to be run like a business. And he's the best guy to do it because he is a billionaire. He can't get bought out by special interest people. And he, he's willing to step up for the people. You know, I think about it and through my career, you look at guys like Dwayne Johnson, who's called the people's champ. Um, I try to take that name myself as I ended my career because I all looked good amongst the people. I think Trump is the people's champ right now. He's the one that we need. We need the head coach to win games after games after games. And like I said, I, I've supported him since, two, since 2016. I've known um, President Trump since uh, 2000. I fought his casino in 2000 and UFC 30. Um, He's came to a bunch of my fights. Uh, I worked on a celebrity apprentice. I see what type of man he is, as type of father he is, and what type of patriot he is to this country. And when he ran in 2016, I was all in. I've never uh, voted for a president ever in my life. Uh, it made me do my research. It made me, you know, we, we got stuck in our homes in 2020 from this pandemic. And I really uh, did my research on politics. Um, at the time in Huntington Beach, California, where I'm born and raised for 47 years, uh, the crime there just started going through the roof and I want to be a police officer. So I went on Fox uh, News and I started talking about it and my cell phone blew up. All my friends who are sheriff and PD, like Tito, this is the most toxic time right now to actually be a police officer. Don't do it. So I want to do something to kind of help my community, help my city. And uh, I ran for city council. I was mayor pro tem of Huntington Beach and I got a taste of politics. And once again, I'm not a politician. I'm part of being a politician. I'm just one of the constituents that want to save city. I'm one of the constituents that want to save country. And as the more I dug deeper and deeper into it, I started seeing what the deep state truly was. I started seeing what the left is. And people who are Democrats, they're no longer Democrats. It's not Democratic Party anymore. This is totally different. The, just the, the, the evil that is happening, many Democrats that I know, like my mother, I mean, she is so confused because of social or because of uh, mainstream media. The propaganda that they're pitching is. It goes back to World War II with uh, Germany, how uh, Hitler had a radio in everybody's home and made it mandatory to listen to the propaganda. Well, now we have cell phones. Now we have mainstream media. And mainstream media made the um, community or made uh, the public believe in what they wanted to preach. And what they preach right now is false. It's a false narrative what this country truly is about. You know, this is the forefathers fought for our freedoms. They fought for our liberty. And right now in this country, America, being the best country in the world is deteriorating and people don't understand that. And I think they are actually, I think they're starting to turn around. I think they're starting to see and proofs in the plane of what uh, President Biden has done. Um, just he's deteriorated this country over the last three years. I can't believe it'd be last this long, but as in what I see the stuff that media is not showing is scary because a lot of people who have social media and are posting things about what's happening on the border, what's happening with the uh, invasion that's happening on the border. It's scary what's going to happen next. I mean, I live here in Florida and having Russia right off our coast, it's kind of scary. I mean, it's literally a hundred miles away from me. Um, I mean, I live up here in Cape, so it's not super far from Miami. It's two hours from Miami, but just to see that, it shows the weakness of this country right now. And we need a leader and a head coach that's going to come up and protect us as Americans, protect this country and protect the freedoms that we have before it's lost. I mean, what you're saying, Tito, resonates with me uh, tremendously. I came to the country kind of at the beginning of the Reagan era, and it was such an optimistic time 
The country seemed so secure. It was facing external threats, of course, from the Soviet Union and the Soviet Empire. But this kind of internal decay and division, uh, aggressively promoted, as you say, by a media, that's all happened in the last 10 or 15 years. Um, and it's very disturbing. Uh, hey, uh, really appreciate your joining me to share your thoughts, Tito. Guys, I've been talking to Tito Ortiz, a former UFC light heavyweight world champion, UFC Hall of Famer. Uh, he is an athlete, a businessman, uh, a movie and TV actor. He's got a restaurant, Tito's Cantina, Tequila Bar and Grill. Um, it's in Cape Corral, Florida, honey. If we ever get there, we gotta, we have to check this out. Uh, yeah, and actually follow- come on out. I'll take care of the meal for you. Please come out. Uh, I would love for you to come out. Get an opportunity to come. It's actually uh, authentic Mexican food. You know, uh, we got a tequila bar. I'm not sure if you drink alcohol, but. Uh, I'll put the meal on me. I'll take care of you, um, you and your wife. Yeah, that'd be awesome. You guys get an opportunity to come out. We, we'd love it. And I also want to hear about a couple of your, your, your biggest fights. So, guys, I've been talking to Tito Ortiz. Follow him on social media, at Tito Ortiz. Uh, Tito, thank, thank you very much for joining me. I appreciate it. And all my fans, I appreciate it. If I have new fans, thank you so much for your uh, support. You guys can check out on uh, Instagram. It's Tito uh, Ortiz. Uh, IG on Instagram, of course, Tito Ortiz on uh, X and uh, Facebook. Same thing. Thank you so much, Dinesh. Have a wonderful day. I appreciate you having me on the show. Thank you. I'm uh, continuing uh, my discussion of the four British folkways that shaped America. I'm talking about the fourth, which is the culture of the borderlands transplanted to the backcountry of America, so called redneck culture. It's also sometimes called a cracker culture. These are all sort of slang terms, sometimes used derisively, sometimes used affectionately. But you're talking about a kind of rough and tough people. And I mentioned yesterday that there is this kind of myth that feminists have promoted of of equality on the frontier. It's kind of like in civilized life, men and women are so different, men are patriarchal, they rule the roost, but in uh, kind of out there uh, on the frontier and in the back country, things are really very egalitarian. Everybody does the same kind of work. Now, everyone may do similar types of work, but the, the back country always was and still is very patriarchal. In fact, the uh, the lives of men and women were, in many ways, um, the lives of two sort of uh, hardworking people uh, uh, kind of sc- trying to scrape off the land and not necessarily even relating that well to each other, but very clearly with the man being the dominant, um, the dominant figure in this culture. Now, let me talk about, about the religious uh, approach of the, of the backcountry. First of all, it's religiously quite diverse. So unlike the Puritans who were, in a sense, of one mind, of one denomination, or the um, Anglicans, the Cavaliers, they, were, they have a unified faith. The Quakers, the same thing. And so, uh, however, with regard to the, uh, the backcountry, You've got some. You've got some Calvinists. You've got some Presbyterians. You've got some Anglicans. It's kind of a mix. But let's remember that their motive in coming to America was not primarily religious. This is what differentiates this group. They mainly came because they had a terrible life back in the home country. Uh, a lot of war, a lot of famine, a lot of exploitation, and they just thought we can do better. So they came for a better life. In that sense, a more kind of classic uh, story of, uh, of immigration. In general, the the rednecks tend to be both religious but also anti-clerical. There's a very uh, amusing story here. It actually was from a travel account of 1766. An Anglican missionary is going through the uh, the back country. He's in the interior of the Carolinas, and people keep attacking him. They steal his horse. They take away his clothing. They drink his rum. They stole his prayer books. And so he thought, they don't really like me. I got, I got to leave. And so he starts packing up to go. But then a bunch of people show up at his, at his cabin and they say, uh, they say, hey, uh, you know, we have, um, we have a bunch of people gathered, you know, at the local, um, at, the, at, at this local uh, parsonage, this local church house. Why don't you come and preach a hellfire sermon? So 
the whole idea here is that the mo while the guy was identified as an Anglican with Anglican vestments and robes, he was the enemy. He was sort of the established church back in England. Uh, but the moment that he was just an ordinary guy, is just packing up his horse and taking off, that was like, oh, hey, you know what? We need a preacher. Come give us your message. We want to hear you out. So this is the this is the peculiar style, if you will, of the back of the back country. And um, and um, these are uh, people with very low levels of schooling. Think about it. How many universities can you name in Appalachia? Basically none. Uh, or hardly any. Uh, how many, if you look at the entire SWAT, it's something like 800 miles. Uh, and if you were to name colleges and universities, there are some, but they're kind of sparsely spread out. Um, the, um, what about the, uh, the cuisine of the, um, of the back country? Answer, kind of what you'd expect. It's hearty food, but it's simple, very little ornamentation, actually very little spices. Uh, by and large, in the back country, they didn't eat three meals a day. They ate two meals a day, kind of a breakfast and then a mid-afternoon kind of hearty meal. And so English travelers going through the back country were like, well, where's breakfast? Where's lunch? Where's tea? Where's dinner? And the answer is, no, you don't have those four things. You basically got breakfast and then you got one midday meal and then that's it. And by the way, um, no typical elaborate forks and knives, no china, none of that. By and large, sometimes the knife that you ate with was kind of a hunting knife and then uh, just a heavy spoon and uh, very little of the uh, ornamentation that you would see, for example, in Virginia and other parts of the South. Now, um, I um, want to talk about redneck sports. Uh, and the most common one, you might guess, and you'd be right, wrestling or fighting. Wrestling is the redneck word for wrestling. And um, again, we turn to travel accounts. This is, a, to me, a very funny one. Uh, it comes from an Irish traveler named Thomas Ash, who is traveling through the backcountry, and he says he he encountered a fight between a West Virginian and a Kentuckian. So basically, two rednecks who get into a fight, and he says it starts off kind of ordinary. They exchange a couple of blows, but he goes suddenly. He goes to my great surprise. He goes the Virginian, the West Virginian pitched himself into the bosom of his opponent, so like dives into his chest, sinks his sharpened fingernails into the man's head, so he starts scratching him. Uh, and then uh, after a little bit, he tries to gouge his eyes out. Now the other guy, not to be, uh, not to be defenseless, he, uh, he quote, fastens his teeth on the Kentuckian's nose and bit it in two pieces, and then he begins to bite the Kentuckian's ears. And all the while, the crowd is cheering. So I take this to be the origins of mixed martial arts. This is, this is the actual roots, of the cultural roots of the MMA. And what I mean by that is that you've got here free, uh, free for all type of fighting. No real rules, you're kicking aloud, biting aloud, pushing aloud, uh, gouging aloud. And, uh, and this is the aggression with which uh, you have to say young people in the, in the back country, just as they were in the borderlands of Great Britain, they're raised this way. Um, now, um, let me talk about the redneck idea of freedom. The redneck idea of freedom is very different than the Puritan idea, the Anglican idea, the Quaker idea. To recapitulate the Puritan idea of freedom in a nutshell, we want the freedom as a community to establish our own way of life and impose it on others if we can, and if not, they need to leave, uh, or we need to get rid of them. The Anglican idea is more uh, hierarchical. It's a little bit more like the class structure in England. Freedom is really the ability to be at the top of society where you can do whatever you want, although really nobody else can. They've got to do what you tell them. The Quakers had a very re a reciprocal idea of liberty. I'll respect your rights if you respect mine. But for the rednecks, for the back country, it was, it was more leave me alone. Uh, I don't want 
anyone, certainly not any kind of centralized government, uh, to tell me what to do. And this even applies to what you would consider to be the, the primary functions of government. The primary function of government is protection, right? The police force, the sheriff. But for rednecks, they were very reluctant to call the sheriff. If somebody did something wrong to you, the idea was you've got to go and secure justice directly. So in the backcountry culture, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of retributive uh, murders. Uh, there's a there's a lot of um, there's a lot of basically an eye for an eye. There's a lot of uh, there's the idea that I've got to go and rectify the wrong. Somebody makes uh, catcalls at my daughter, I go get my shotgun, I head over there. And by the way, you can see this even today. I mean, by and large, the idea of somebody who's insulted, for example, going and, and showing up at the other guy's house and threatening them or challenging them, this, for example, is not only common in a state like Texas, it's considered a positive virtue. I believe there's even a Texas law that by and large says even today that if you find your wife in bed with somebody else in sort of at the moment, you, you can shoot them. Now, imagine this in Massachusetts. They'd be appalled at this idea. Oh, no, there's a system of justice. Oh, no, you can't possibly do that. Oh, no, you might just want to go file for divorce and so on. So my point I'm getting at is that you have not only it's not just a matter that the backcountry and the rednecks have a way of behaving. They also have an ethic that holds this kind of behavior to be the right way to act. Uh, a man who doesn't act this way is considered kind of abnormal. And so for the rednecks, you have this idea of natural liberty. We're born in nature. We function in nature. Um, nature operates by, in a sense, the rules, of, uh, the rules that exist prior to civilization. And in a sense, backcountry culture is, is based on that. And um, these people were an important part of establishing, you will, the code of the Western the code of the uh, the lone gunman, the the code of leave me alone, and although these days this uh, ethic runs completely counter to progressive society, nevertheless it is I think an important strand of modern conservatism, not the conservatism of the American Enterprise Institute or Hoover, but the kind of instinctive conservatism, and a lot of these guys uh, today are supporters of Trump. Subscribe to the Dinesh D'Souza podcast on Apple, Google, and Spotify, or watch on Rumble, YouTube, and SalemNow.com.